Good morning. Uh, I'm sure we'll have some more people uh, kind of trickling in, but I thought we'd go ahead and introduce our speakers today and get started. Um, our first speaker today is uh, Barbara Ros Rosco. Um, she's a clinical associate professor here at the Moran. She's going to be speaking to us about research opportunities here, which should be very interesting. Uh, we also have uh, from uh, the lower campus, uh, Joyce uh, Mitchell. Oh. Oh, here in the medical school. Thank you. Um, Joyce Mitchell, uh, she's the Associate Vice President uh, for Academic Health uh, Information Technology, Professor and Chair of the Department of Biomedical Informatics. Uh, she's going to be speaking uh, to us about a uh, clinical cohort uh, finding system to help us uh, with our research as well. So uh, please welcome them. So I actually have Steve to, um, to thank for this opportunity and sort of the, the stimulus here to, to think about doing this. So when I sat, I don't know if um, Mark's here, yes. So when I was here, Mark gave uh, grand rounds maybe about a month ago, primarily focused on the residency program. He hit upon a few topics on what he had heard from the residents in terms of research that was available here at the Moran. And when I was joining or coming on board and talking to Randy, we started talking maybe about six years ago, it was the first time I met Randy, I saw the opportunities here and I said, wow, this is just such a great place to do all aspects of research. I don't have a PhD, I've never really been in a lab per se working at the bench except now with Bala doing some animal studies, but there's so many types of research and it's really here, it's right here and, and Steve o also opened up another whole opportunity opportunity that's here through further, which is what um, Dr. Joyce Mitchell is going to speak about. So this is supposed to be interactive, it's supposed to be creative, it's really geared towards the residents, medical students, fellows. So what is research? Well, it's a careful or diligent search, studious inquiry or an examination, especially an investigation or an experimentation aimed at the discovery and interpretations of facts. Revisions of accepted theories of laws in the light of new facts or practical application. It's the collection of information about a particular subject. So basically, just ask a question, any question. There's all different types of research. Observational research, correlation research, quasi-experiments, and true experiments. So what's observational? Well, case studies, human behavior studies. Primary characteristic is that the phenomenon are being observed and recorded. So you can even do a prospective observational study in triage. How many patients come in with corneal ulcers? And what's the inciting event? Is there a difference in patients presenting in the summer versus the winter? What about dry eye? Dry eye is supposed to be seasonal. In fact, I was just at a conference this past weekend where I don't know how many of you are familiar with eye gate. So it's iontophoresis for the treatment of dry eye. And they ran a clinical trial, phase three, no surprise, did not meet their primary endpoint. But what they did find was that the recruitment of the sites differed over the year. And the results for that site differed by season. Very observational, informative. Correlation, this is a very busy slide, but basically it examines the co-variation of two or more variables. So let's think about this. So research on cigarette smoking, and you want to see if there's a correlation between lung cancer and cigarette smoking. There's two variables here. The variable is the smoking and the lung disease. Do they vary together? Do they vary at the same rate? So somebody who increases smoking, does that increase their rates of cancer? of lung cancer. Correlation research can be accompanied by uh, various techniques. You can do it retrospective, you can do it prospective, you can do a database analysis. You could do a cross-sectional study. Just bring some patients in. Again, I'm going to use triage. So patients come in with corneal ulcers. What's the correlation between the corneal ulcer and contact lens use? Over the past five years, what's the correlation between contact lens use and sleeping in their contact and corneal ulcers. Again, correlation, it's observational, 
Nothing is manipulated. You're not treating. It's not interventional. And it's not necessarily casual research. Correlation research is often conducted as an exploratory, exploratory or a beginning research. And again, um, with Dr. Joyce Mitchell here, when she talks about what can be gained from this further database that everyone has access to, it's really exploring correlations. Steve and I were talking about, hmm, there's a lot of research now on sleep apnea and glaucoma. Do the glaucoma patients here at the university have a higher correlation with sleep apnea? The data's all over the place. Some people have found, yes, there's a correlation. Other people have not. Search the database. See. Look at the diagnoses. Quasi-experiments. I actually like this term. So they're, they're similar to true experiments, um, but they use naturally formed or pre-existing groups. So the subjects can't be randomized. And it's not a true experiment, but it's not a junk experiment. An example would be lung capacity in old and young individuals. So there's a lot of confounding variables. You've got pollutants, you've got cigarette smoke, you've got demographics, you've got age, you've got where the patient lives. So there's a lot of differences between the groups that you can't control for. But again, some of those differences could account for your findings. So you design, you carefully assess the casual, the causality with your quasi-experimental designs. And again, in some ways, it's similar to a correlation, uh, a correlation study. But you can control one of the variables. So maybe you can have the patient stop smoking. So in some ways, it's partly interventional, but you're not controlling as you would for a prospective <coughs> clinical study. And this is the true experiment. So this is probably what most of you are familiar with. You have at least two groups. You have an experimental group and a control group. And each group will receive a level or a change of the independent variable. So you've got an independent variable. You've got a dependent variable. And the dependent variable will be measured to determine if the independent variable has an effect. So let's put this into perspective, glaucoma study. Your dependent variable is your IOP. You're going to see if your independent variable, which is your glaucoma treatment, is having an effect on your dependent variable. And then you're going to ask if there's a correlation with that IOP and progression over long term. So there's your correlation component. The control group is going to provide us with a baseline. And in true prospective randomized studies, and I'll get into a little bit about that, you do have a control group because you want to know what is happening if you're not intervening with that independent variable. All subjects should be randomly assigned and be tested in parallel. Because again, as we saw with my example with the eye gate, patients were not necessarily treated in parallel. You had one site enrolling in June, the next site enrolling in December. So they were treated within the site in parallel, but they were actually treated at different time courses, and that actually affected the outcome in this dry eye study. And again, it was pretty, a pretty major deal because they failed to meet their primary endpoint in a phase three study. Should it be conducted as a blinded or masked study? And it's funny, you can always tell the people that I joke about this, you may have heard me say this, but you can always tell the people who have worked in ophthalmology because we never say a blinded study. We always say it's masked. So what are the components to a controlled prospective study? Experimental or the treatment group where you vary that independent variable. You have your control group. You have an independent variable, as I mentioned, dependent. It's a random assignment. And again, it could be double blinded or masked. Investiga investigator or single masked is another term. Various forms, you can have a clinical prospective study, which is interventional again, phase one through phase four. And again, you can have non-interventional, and we spoke a little bit about retrospective, case studies, database analysis, we'll go more into, and literature reviews. There's various levels of evidence and when you think about the level of evidence, the tip of our pyramid is systematic reviews, which are reviews of what's already in the literature on published studies. So for instance, if you did a 
systematic review of all the Lucenta studies and came out with a conclusion on the efficacy and the AEs, that would be probably the highest um, level of evidence because it's a conglomerate of studies. Below that, again, is your randomized controlled trial, going down cohort studies, case control, case series, and then at the bottom are editorial and export op expert opinions, which still carry weight, but their level um, is on the lower end. So what's an interventional clinical study? We call them randomized control tr trials, or RCTs, and again, they're randomized, and that is the preferred way to assign participants to control or interventional. This eliminates some controls for variables. So you want each treatment group at the baseline, that patient to look very similar across treatment groups. Age, race, demographics, baseline dry eye, corneal findings, IOP, et cetera. And then again, you want to mask, so you want to remove the bias. You don't want to know that Mrs. Jones is actually getting treatment. You want to know, or placebo, you want to know that you don't know what she's receiving. And again, it removes the bias, both of her and you. An assignment of a parti uh, participant is determined by a formal process of randomization. I've been throwing around randomization, but it's really just a random numbering. And you can, this can be accomplished in large clinical trials either through a IVRS or an IWRS, or even in the clinic, if you have a small trial, you can just basically say, okay, patient one, group X, patient two, group Y, patient three, group X, and just assign them randomly, so whoever walks in the door. Chances are, based on statistics and probability, that if you have a large enough group of patients, they will fall fairly evenly across the treatment groups, and that's what you hope for. So why is randomization so important? Well, it's the preferred way of assigning participants, as I said, to control and intervention, and it eliminates and controls for the variables. It also establishes similar patients across treatment arms. To test additional variables, you can stratify. So again, let me, I'll get back to a glaucoma study. So I want to know if my treatment, X, works better than a placebo or a vehicle. But I don't know if it's going to work better if patients have IOPs from 21 to 25 or from 25 to 28. So I can stratify, so I can have within my first treatment group two groups of patients, the lower IOP and the higher IOP, and they'll both receive treatment X. My placebo, higher IOP, lower IOP. So within that treatment arm, you now have two groups, and you're also asking the question, does the treatment work, but does it work differently between those two IOP levels? What's the placebo effect? And I was thinking of um, when Tony Adamus was here and was talking about the patients who are able to see better. And I think this happens all the time. You know, the patient thinks that they're getting better or they think there's something going on and they, they try a little bit harder or they're reading a little bit better. But placebo, when I looked into this, actually I was quite surprised because there really is some conscious belief in the patient that the drug is working or at least if they're getting the intervention. And there's a subconscious association between recovery and the experience of being treated. And we see this all the time, again, even in glaucoma studies, the patients who receive placebo across the board have a two drop in, a two millimeter drop in IOP. So when you look to see if your intervention, very early glaucoma studies, if you're studying your drug against your vehicle, just assume that your placebo, your vehicle group, no active, will have two millimeters of mercury drop. And this has been well reported, well studied, so again, if you're looking for a benefit of your drop, you have to almost look at four to six because your placebo will have some effect. And researchers, again, have demonstrated that, that it actually may be a response from the brainstem. So there is some subconscious and conscious um, components to placebo. So again, very important to mask. So how do you control for the placebo effect? Well, again, patients do do better in clinical trials than they would 
doctors coming into your clinic, if they are receiving a placebo in a controlled trial, maybe they're more responsive, maybe they're more attentive, maybe they're following directions better in these clinical trials. Maybe we've also weeded out the non-compliant patients, which is another reason why patients always do better in clinical trials. And I sort of mentioned this already. So basically, when you're thinking about clinical trials, recognize that there's going to be a placebo effect, accept it, and then just plan for it in your statistical analysis. So just to briefly go over some different um, phases of clinical trials. So a phase one is generally a dose-ranging study in healthy individuals, and you're really looking for safety. Generally open label, although it could be mass, and you can measure pharmacokinetics of the drug. So you're looking to see if your drug is actually getting absorbed, what the exposure is, and if there's any safety concerns. Phase two, I like to think about that now you've taken that drug and you said, okay, it's safe in healthy individuals, let's put it into a diseased patient population. Because you never know if the safety will be different in that patient with the disease. And again, I think about our ophthalmology patients, a drug that's really irritating to the cornea that you're gonna use for a keratitis patient may be well tolerated in a healthy white quiet eye, but actually could be very irritating and very um, intolerant in a patient that has an ocular keratitis. Generally, primary endpoint is safety, although you do want to see an efficacy signal. So you'd like to see that your drug is having some effect and is doing somewhat of what it's supposed to in that disease population. Phase 2Bs are generally larger, and these help you to inform the phase 3, which are the largest studies, which are generally the regulatory studies. So your phase 2B are statistically powered for an efficacy single, and again, you want to inform your phase three. So here's where you're going to know how large is your effect, what are you going to need to do to power your study to actually get a signal, a statistically significant signal, and then also what's your comparator. And your phase 2B will actually help you determine that. And again, your phase three, obviously, um, everybody, I think, for the most part is aware in just very, very large studies. We tend to be small in ophthalmology compared to cardiovascular. Some of those studies are thousands of patients, three, four thousand patients, thousands of patients. There are also millions of dollars, and we tend to be several hundred patients. Um, again, phase three, you want it to be more representative of real world. Sometimes the criteria are a little bit relaxed. They may not be as stringent in terms of the patient that you're studying. And um, chronic conditions can have very, very long phase three studies. Even if the primary endpoint is only a three month or six month, a lot of times these patients are followed for years outward because the FDA really wants to see if you're treating chronically, what's the safety over time. And then phase four, these are also tend to be long studies. They're open label. Um, they can be epidemiologic. They can be observational. They also can be mass studies. It could be extensions. But it's really, again, to capture real-world experience. So take the patient out of the clinical study, remove the placebo, remove the, you know, um, the, the clinical parameters of, of being stringent and the compliant patients and really see what the real-world experience is with the drug. And we've seen this with Vioxx. Vioxx had a, a safety signal, had a black box. Um, other drugs actually have been pulled from the market. And again, it's really to capture what is that experience beyond that clinical trial population. So what are the research opportunities here at the Moran? Well, they're tremendous. And they're traditional clinical trials. And we have got, we're fortunate enough to have Dr. Bernstein here leading the clinical research, as well as Deborah Harrison, who manages the clinical trials. So again, they're definitely the go-to people if, um, if you want to hear or learn more. You can do investigator-initiated research, so IIRs. You can actually apply to a pharma company, and you can use a compound that's in development or is already approved, and you can look at novel new treatments, or you could just do an additional study in the same group of patients. So I'm trying to think what comes to mind. Um, think about, or I don't know. Um, Erythromycin. <laughs> I'm sorry to think of everything that I was talking about today. So 
you want to look at erythromycin, I don't even know if it's approved for angular blepharitis. I don't know, I don't think it is, okay. Yeah. Tivitis. So it's a perfect example. So angular blepharitis. How many times do we use angular blepharitis to treat, or actually erythromycin to treat angular blepharitis? We could do a study looking at the use of erythromycin in treating angular blepharitis versus Maxitrol, gentamicin, exactly. If you do go to a pharma company and want to use a drug off-label, so for instance, if you want to use Lucentis for the treatment of post-trabeculectomy fibrosis studies, a lot of times if they're going to allow you to do the study and or give you grant money to do the study, it has to make financial or commercial sense for them. So it has to be an area that they would be interested in looking at or pursuing, perhaps. Then it makes much more economical business sense to them. But it actually is a very neat way to do research with drugs that you have at your hand. So it doesn't need to be an experimental drug. It could be something that's actually in the clinic. So retrospective chart reviews. Again, just ask a question. And this came up recently with a patient um, that I had who was on Durazole, and she had a very, very pronounced IOP spike that was very, very difficult to treat. Um, I don't know if we really know. We, we know that Durazole will cause an IOP spike, and we've got cataract surgeons using it routinely, post-operatively, but how rapid is the spike? What's the degree of that IOP spike? Is it more difficult to treat? What's the onset? Is it at four weeks? Is it at six weeks post-operative treatment? There's so much here that we don't know about this drug. And again, this is a drug that you have at your fingertips. It's just been approved. It's just been marketed. And it's a very, very strong steroid. It's worth studying. Look through your charts. If this is a drug that you use routinely, follow your patients. Just ask some questions about it. Or again, the medical students, the residents, Ask some questions about it. What, what don't we know about this drug? We don't know a lot. Um, we know very little. And um, again, retrospective chart review is a great way to look and say, you know, what's happening or what had happened to these patients. <coughs> and you can always use historic data, too. That's another neat thing. There's a lot of historic data on the rate of IOP elevation in, in steroid use with dexamethasone, with prednisolone. So you've got a historic database that you can compare it to. What's the most common ocular pathology at the triage? Um, again, I wonder about the patients that I see a lot of corneal ulcers there, and there's a lot of patients sleeping in their contact lenses. Are there more younger patients sleeping in their contact lenses? Is that why they're having more corneal ulcers that present? And is there a greater incidence of corneal ulcers here at the Moran than, say, in another large urban city. Literature review. There's been a lot of recent interest in, again, just gonna throw out some ideas, choroidal thickening in AMD and also in glaucoma patients. And what does the data tell us? It's sort of all over the place. We know that if you measure choroidal thickness, you're getting a measure of choroidal blood volume and ocular blood flow. Well, is there a correlation between AMD? Is there a correlation between glaucoma? You could review all the present literature and do a, a literature review, publish an editorial, publish a review of the literature. So I wanted to pull up one example. David DeMille over the summer had come to me and said he was curious as to what patients looked like when they entered a glaucoma clinical trial and did various inclusion or exclusion criteria affect the outcome? So again, thinking about that eye gate example, patients were enrolled. Oh, another interesting finding that they found was that during the study, patients that had decreased corneal sensitivity, actually makes sense, had worse outcomes in the fact that they did not notice as much of an improvement. 
Now they did not stratify or they did not set inclusion criteria based around corneal sensitivity, but this was something they found. So obviously, if you're conducting a dry eye study and you want to know if patients feel better, you have to enroll patients who can actually feel <laughs> their corneas. And this is what they learned retrospectively. So David had said, you know, well, what about when you enroll glaucoma patients? You're talking about IOP, you're talking about demographics, you're talking about baseline IOP, you're talking about um, prior medications, diagnoses. So he was really instrumental and just did a very thorough literature search on the phase two and the phase three studies. He had some criteria by what he used to define the studies he looked at, and we, we ended up with four papers, so three of which have been accepted already. And it was, it was pretty cool. You know, it really was just a question. It was just a question. Database analysis, and this is where here I'm going to introduce perfect timing to Dr. Joyce Mitchell. So again, Steve was working in, in triage with me one day, and he said, did you know that there's access to this database that really just has a wealth of information, and we can actually ask questions. We could say, what's the correlation between glaucoma and sleep apnea? We could ask the question between AMD and diabetes in the Utah patient population. So that was pretty much my introduction, and Steve has been um, instrumental in, again, introducing this to me, and I thought it was so valuable that I wanted to introduce it to you. So I thank Joyce very much for being here. I'm going to let her introduce herself. <laughs> but with that, Joyce Mitchell. Thank you.